Welcome to Global Conversations About Boundaries. I am so excited to have my guest, Bill Burnett, here today. I have three words that sum up Bill for you. Brave, vulnerable, and funny. And he has a <laughs> TED Talk about depression. So we'll have a link for that for you to hear that. What, what could be braver more vulnerable than that. And yet you did it with humor. So Bill, what have you experienced from just sharing your own story so publicly? Well, I would say the number one takeaway is that most people are really not alienated by it. Um, I was really afraid because it started in little steps and then progressed over a, a number of years where I was revealing more or I was speaking in not just a little coffee shop in Capitol Hill that nobody's really going to see who's not there to, okay, now it's on this thing. Now it's showing up on the radio or it's showing up on the internet. Okay. okay. And so, so you did this like in stages. Which yes. Yes. Because I thought your, your TEDx talk was so brave. And what you're saying is it took a while to get to that place of sharing your story in that way. Absolutely. Yes, it took a while to get there. And, and I, I got there because my confidence built each time that I did, you know, share. I mean, for the most part, I might have had a bad, a bad night here or there. And not everybody is like, you know, that's great. But few, not that many people are really put off by it. And a lot of people are grateful for the opportunity to talk about something that they're not able to talk about in their own lives. So they like to see other people get up and tell stories. Yeah, so that brings me to my next question because now you really help other people tell their stories. And what is it, it, there must be some reason why you do this. Like, why do you think it helps to share your story? Well, for, yeah, for, for a few different reasons. Um, I think that for me, sharing my story is like a way to sort of get my own perspective around the narrative of things I've been through, some of which are really intense, and um, to sort of not have to dwell on those little niggling things about this and that about it, sort of get my head around something. But more than that, it's a way to feel connected to people because every time I get up and tell a story or give a talk, I'm always thinking, who is this for? Who do I want to hear this? And what do I want them to hear? What, you know, idea or, or, you know, positive message am I giving to whom? So to me, it's very grounded in who I imagine it might be listening that could benefit in some way. So that really makes me feel connected and, um, then helping other people, that's just community building. And, and that's what I love about it. I love getting together with people and working on stories. And I love, I get so excited about the inner journey um, because uh, to me, it's like we celebrate in our society like the outer world achievements. I got this house, I got this job, I got this spouse. And those are great. And by all means, we should, you know, aim to achieve what we want in the world. But the inner world, when people are depressed and they learn how to deal with it, or they have this fear and they overcome it, like those to me, that's way more epic to me. Like <laughs> it's yes. not as, as yes. visible. And there isn't a place to kind of talk no. about it. It's so exciting to me. So I just love hearing people's inner journey and helping them feel, see the relief when other people hear it and to be able to share it and connect with other people. It's also really taking away the stigma of talking about depression, anxiety. You talk about bipolar, you talk about feeling suicidal. You talk about topics that maybe not everybody is comfortable talking about and you make it comfortable. You make it like, you know, <laughs> this is just kind of part of life, folks. And there's, you also kind of take away the shame that sometimes gets hidden around all of that stuff where 
to well, I'm glad that you phrased that. that. And that, that's exactly what I try to do. And there was a, a journey around that, whereas at first I was kind of tentative on stage. But as I did it more, I realized that um, I realized a couple of things. One is nobody really cares that much. Like you, you, you build up this idea of people are going to vilify me. It's going to be awful. And <laughs> Five minutes later, they're like, Bill who? <laughs> right? Right. Once you realize that nobody's thinking that much about you, it's like, oh, that was, you know, right. And, you're just and passing through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, and there have been times when I've gone over that line and, and I learned the hard way where, oh, that alienates an audience. It was funny to me because I've lived there and I'm not triggered by it, but like that was too much. So there's been a process of learning how people receive it, but there came a point where I realized- well, That's a really important thing. Cause like these, yeah. are, these are topics that, that obviously are very sensitive. And you're, what's so beautiful about the way I think you talk about it is you just share some of your own journey in it and you don't hold any like shaming stigma about it. And so I think that invites the audience to feel like, yeah, it's just kind of Bill's story. If I want to convey a message that this is easy to talk about, that it's there is no stigma, then I need to like live that on stage. So that was a conscious decision. But then at the same time, I've been talking about it now for so long that it's no longer, I can't, I can't even remember why I was supposed to be ashamed, if that makes sense. It's like, to me, it's all just a part oh, of I nature. I love hearing that. I can't <laughs> even remember why you were supposed to feel that because there's no context for that any longer in your life. Right, it right, right. No anchors to you whatsoever. Yeah, You're yeah, like, yeah. I can't even get why I would feel that way. That is so powerful. That does come, I think, from practicing telling your story and getting more and more comfortable just being in your own skin and sharing your story and owning your story and realizing there is no stigma. It's just your life. And now in these times, like... There's lots of people who are experiencing depression and anxiety who also may have not really had a lot of experience with that. And so it may be pretty overwhelming in these times or scary if you're going through that for the first time. And there are others who have some history and experience with that, but during the pandemic, you know, are really being pulled down. But many more people are experiencing depression and anxiety. How do you see these particular times and how has it been for you, Bill? Well, I'll start with saying how I see this in general. What you're saying is true. A lot of people aren't familiar with feelings of hopelessness or feelings of extreme anxiety. And they're facing those because the pandemic has, has created a lot of different situations that people you know, have to face. And um, you know, my heart goes out to them because for people I know who've learned to live well or reasonably well with depression and anxiety, it's been a journey of starting to like realize, oh, I have this body reaction. My, I start breathing, you know, panic breathing, or I have everything looks dark and hopeless and there's absolutely no way out. There's a long journey to realizing these are physical and mental activities that are not related to, not immediately connected to what's actually happening. And so that awareness, I think, is, is a big advantage. And I think a lot of people are having to learn that in a really short period of time. So my heart goes out to them and uh, it's tough times. I was talking to a friend who lives with bipolar disorder and she was saying that a lot of her friends, she's a mom, a lot of her mom type friends come to her for support because she, the way with the, with the analogy we use was that it was like, she's been going to the gym every day for her whole life because she just has to to survive around these things and now other people are just working out for the first time and they're like whoa that's kicking my butt you know what do i do here yes yeah. yes and so that is definitely where we have found ourselves and that you know it does having experience and having 
not just having the experience of depression and anxiety, but having some tools and some skills that you yep. know help you through. So what are the tools and skills <clears throat> that really help you the most, Bill? My number one tool around anxiety is around breathing. And I know there's a lot of different guidance out there around breathing. So I don't have particular method I recommend. I mean, I can tell you what I do because I, I started in mantra meditation when I was young and I have these grounding philosophical things that tie into watching the breath um, and, and observing that that can really be helpful. A few centering breaths can make a big, big difference. Um, and for those who are listening, if you're wanting to try some really simple breathing, it is um, count to four on an in-breath and count to six on an out-breath. In other words, make your exhale slower and longer and make your inhale a little bit shorter and faster and then do a long, slow exhale. And that will help with calming and relaxing some of the tension you may be feeling in your body. Go ahead. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, so so that definitely can help um, with immediate anxiety. Um, with depression, it's often a matter of um, awareness. So at some point, because depression doesn't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm getting depressed. Depression, for me, it feels like the world is doomed. All of a sudden, like just every news station is like, Bill is doomed. This is going to go badly. There's no hope here. You know, and that looks like reality for a while until I'm like, oh, <laughs> I know what's going on here. And then it's sort of a matter of, of trusting that it's going to pass. And then I have a number of mental tools. And that I also is such a helpful perspective because most people, when I meet them in like a therapy setting, they don't realize they're depressed. And so what you just described is, you know, it kind of can sneak up on you and then you realize, oh, that's the thing in the room. Oh, I get it. You're telling me like there's no hope and everything is doomed and nothing is going to work out. And you're, it talks all about the future and it kind of takes away any possibility. And you're like, once that tape starts rolling in my head, that's my signal. I know that that's mm -hmm. the depression. And I know, oh, that's not actually real because the truth is for those who are listening, none of us know the future. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know that everything is going to be doomed. And so it's really important when you hear that future negative talk to realize that we don't really have the ability to know those things. Yeah. And you brought up a good point there, which is that people who are depressed may not know they're depressed. Um, I remember, this is going back maybe a lot of years now, but uh, I was listening to NPR and they said that there was a recent study that found in some state at the time, like that had the most suicidal ideation of any state people who had ide ideation. It was like, um, <clears throat> you know, it was like 5% of the people and it was like still less than 5% in a year had suicide. And I thought that can't be right. It must be 95% who do. <laughs> and then I, was, I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm the freak. <laughs> Not the freak, but I'm kind of joking, right? But it was funny to me, like, oh, right. I got it backwards. That, and then I realized like, oh, people have a really significantly different experience of life from me in that regard at, at that time. Yeah. I mean, since then, I've learned a lot of tools and a lot has shifted, but it's yeah, easy. And that it's... Is so that is so helpful when you say like, you know, it affects your whole frame of reference to things and that, and that, you know, you have to like, think like, do other people think this way? And maybe other people don't think this way, because they may not be depressed. And so that's, let's, let's jump over to your storytelling, because you help people tell their story. Yes, I do. Um, so I've definitely done a lot of coaching around depression and anxiety. People have done this with nonprofits and in other contexts to help people share their story or give a talk around so depression and anxiety. Like? like what do they do when you work with them? Is it like a group or is it one-on-one? -on -one? Sometimes I'll do it one-on-one. -on -one. Usually it's a small group. I will start by wanting to know 
what people want to communicate, why they're doing it, what is their passion, what's motivating them to do this, and I want to know who who are they doing it for when they so that when they get on stage they're thinking of who who am I doing this for what people do I want to benefit and what do I want them to get out of it like so I start really high level the next thing is a little bit trickier is uh, picking a story and then figuring out what to talk about and so we do caution people at the start that they don't need to talk about anything they're not comfortable talking about and that um, they have complete control over where their story goes and where the conversation about working on their story in the workshop goes. And that guidance comes from crossing that line and not realizing it and then getting, you know, getting told, hey, that was harsh. Uh, and then rethinking what we're doing. Yeah, because that's a lot to, you know, to think about, like, how do we share stories about this inner experience that has been so difficult in society at times, right? And right. people have dealt with things like not being able to get help or getting help that doesn't help or having to be in a hospital where, you know, at all the boundaries are kind of defined because there are no boundaries in one's life at that moment mm. that are safe or secure yeah. and so something has to be done to kind of keep safety around you and so to tell these stories feels vulnerable but it also feels like there is something about what we started earlier that it really helps with releasing any shame or stigma mm. or blame because you're talking about your story and each time you're taking a step of kind of freeing yourself of there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with the fact that you live through this. Correct. You're taking ownership of it, um, which is really powerful. Like this is my story. This is what happened. And, and now I'm telling you, you know, how that was, you get to work it through. And What's your signal for somebody is telling something that they're not ready to share, like on a stage? It never gets to that point because I don't start with them on a stage. We start in workshops, <laughs> but I have seen people You'll just throw people up there and say, go tell your story. Thanks for we'll coming to the workshop. We got a hundred people out there. Go. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't start like that. But I mean, when somebody is starting people. to share a story in group, is there some signal that you can see they're not really ready for that story to be public. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What are, what are those tell signs that you can tell? It, like It really, you okay. can just sense the emotional distress. So you can see whether they're crying or they can't come up with words or they're just, you can just see the distress in their face. Like they don't know which things they want to talk about. And I'll take a moment to feel that pain with them, but just a moment. And then I'll say, and the way we work on stories is we don't, I don't dwell on that pain. So don't be offended if I'm not dwelling there with you. I'm just going to be me talking really casually and we're going to analyze some really heavy stuff, but I'm, I'm going to be talking about it. Very matter of fact, as we architect your story and talk about, you know, how to bring it out. So that's how I approach it is I don't feed into that feeling, but I let them know that I care and that it's not a disregard for them. And that generally seems to work pretty well. If you can't talk about this comfortably, you shouldn't be including it in your talk um, because we want the audience, right? If we want to shift the way people perceive mental health, we want them to come to the show and not be uncomfortable, but to have a good time and this is where it gets a little bit tricky because the traditional way of doing these stories is to sort of hit on that pain and, and hold there and let the discomfort happen, which is really powerful with an audience of people living with mental health conditions. But when you have an audience, a mainstream audience, you want to factor in their experience, whether you agree that it should be that way or not, doesn't really come into play because people are going to have their experience. So... Um, so it's A, not healthy for you to talk about something if you're not quite comfortable yet, and B, um, they're going to sense your discomfort, and that will impact the way that they receive your message. Yeah, yeah, and well, well let's talk about boundaries around that, because what I do hear you saying is it's okay to have some boundaries around what stories you decide you want to be public with and what stories you really <clears throat> don't. 
Yeah, not only okay, but it's it's Im- imperative. It's kind of like the number one principle to take with you when you start digging into your own psyche for storytelling, for sure. Because you want to be able to have boundaries. Do you see sometimes when people are struggling with their own boundaries, like, you know, that maybe they don't have enough of a sense of how to protect a part of them or recognize that, you know, that part still needs more protection from them. Are you able to see that? I don't know. I don't make that call for them. I really, I give them choice and I watch where they're at. And if they decide they want to talk about something that's really hard for them, I will work with them to make it comfortable for them. But really I let them make that call. Like I'm not qualified to say for sure you shouldn't do, you know, bring this up because like there's so many different. Particularly with bipolar. Sometimes people with bipolar condition have trouble seeing where a boundary could be. And so the boundary isn't always obvious. Yes, I'm laughing. Are... I'm laughing because I, I am bipolar and that, that is an understatement. Yes, carry on. Yeah, so, that sounds familiar, right? <laughs> yeah. It's part yeah. of the condition is that it makes boundaries harder to see. I think that's just a really interesting exploration to be able to know that when you are telling a story, you're allowed to protect whatever you want, that you're allowed to have boundaries. But if you have trouble having boundaries, it's good to know that because sometimes then people end up sharing more than what they felt comfortable with. And then they come back later and say, that kind of freaked me out. That was way too much. I shared stuff that now I don't, now I want to take it back and it's on the internet and it's all out there. Yeah. Right. So I would, a longer process of rehearsal and workshop gives people an opportunity to feel it from different angles and make sure they're comfortable versus Mm -hmm. I went in on Tuesday. um, on Wednesday, we had a show. So if you're, if, you're, if you're taking weeks or ideally months to sort of process it and come to it, the chances that you're comfortable with it will be greater. But secondarily- This is why I never do live interviews with people online. <laughs> this is why. Because I'm always talking about boundaries and mental health issues, right? And mm-hmm. I talk about self-care. But I talk about things where I, you know, somebody may say something that they then realize, I didn't want that out there. And I don't want to be facilitating that kind of harm to someone. Yeah. So yeah. I only do recorded interviews with people. If I'm re- if I'm live, it's fine. But if I'm right. interviewing someone, I always want to do a recording so that people can wake up the next day and say, Sari, I don't want that story out there. Can mm-hmm. you edit that? And I feel like, yeah, we can easily protect and take care of that. I don't cut people's stories out unless Uh, they say like, but I like to know that they have that protection because I do think not everybody has has their boundaries developed enough for the social media world that we live in. And you can feel really exposed. You can feel really exposed and for sure. And people don't. And, And there is a different reception. You're in a workshop with other people living with depression and anxiety. You're going to feel very comfortable and it's a very I love accepting that. So environment. Your groups, your groups are set up to really yes. be a container, like a protective. They're a container. So, space. but you, you want that awareness that that's not the same container when you're up telling your story, right? Because that's so you now you've got people who are not necessarily in your bubble. So you want to be really sure that you feel good about what you're talking about and that. Um, oh, your all- storytelling groups must help people so much. You know, I think they do. We even did. I do some that are not about depression and anxiety. They're just like, let's tell like I do small group storytelling for business. And we did one at Microsoft earlier in the year. You know, people really do come to a lot just through storytelling is such a big deal. So and that's people who weren't even there to process anxiety and depression. They're just telling a story about working in the pandemic. So the people with anxiety and depression, yeah, they get a lot of healing. It's, it's community, right? Even if you just get oh, together, I think, I, three I or four just people. On something so important. It is so important during the pandemic for us to hear each other's stories and to make time. I mean, a lot of us are feeling full, and so you know there might be less space in your relationships where you're really having quality time, where somebody really hears you and receives you. And I think that that is such an important thing because there's been a lot of experiences in this pandemic 
that are going to reveal a lot of stories and that people are carrying a lot of stories inside. And what a helpful thing to facilitate some workshops on people getting to tell their story and uh, and having others listen and just Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be on a big stage, but in a group, just Just in a group. Yeah. Heard and by you and by others to just pause and do that. Right. Even if it's just small storytelling for the group or they go out to like, okay, we'll let people in our broader social circle or our department at work hear the stories. It's and they can be have absolutely nothing to do with depression and anxiety. Even that is really, especially when we're talking about the pandemic, like stories about how people have adapted really, really is uh Really is really valuable for people. I was a little surprised that because I didn't think it was going to get be as healing as it was for people as it was. Oh, I'm not surprised at all. That is exactly <laughs> what people are needing right now. That yeah, is exactly right, right, right. What people are needing. So I want to ask you something about, um, like, for people that are listening. And maybe they're they're feeling like, yeah, I want to tell one of my stories. Where how would I get started? Like, what would you do to like give give people some tips for getting started on telling a story about something they want to tell a story on? Yeah. So um, I personally love stories of personal transformation. So I would say think about something in your life where you changed from having a hard time with something to managing it well or to at least managing it when you weren't before. And then, um, and that would be the place I would start is think of something like that. And then you can work backwards to build a story. Um, you know, you start adding things like, you know, who are you telling it for? What is your passion? Why are you telling it? But if you just sort of think about what personal shift have you had that's that's positive that you'd like to share with people. And then there, the story might be cover a, 20 year period. It might be cover, might be like a five minute period where all these things happen. It could be epic. It could be micro. It was an interaction that happened at a 7-Eleven. So there's so many ways that you can go from there. But if you start with what's my shift, then you're really like, in, and people have always had little shifts, big shifts. There's always a shift to find. So that's not the only kind of storytelling, but it's the kind that I'm really passionate about. And I think it really gives people something to sink into that's meaningful. Oh, thank you. What a great exercise for everyone <laughs> to go do. I'm just going to tell all of you, get a pen and paper and start with that transformational story. We want to hear it and send it yes. in. I'd love to see what your story was. That was fabulous, Bill. Okay. Is there... Um, Anything more that I didn't ask you that you wish I would have brought up? One more thing, which is that if somebody is going to tell a story about their own depression or anxiety, and they're going to do it in a public forum where, you know, people they they don't know are going to consume it, whether um, then it's good to have sort of a care plan for not just before, but for after. So maybe you want to have somebody to check in with, or maybe you're like, I know I'm going to go home and I'm going to watch this movie on Netflix, whatever it is, have some kind of plan because people can be caught unawares of the impact of, whoa, (laughs) until they've gotten up and told stories. They may be a little unprepared. So have some kind of a self-care plan for after you tell your story as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Bill. 